So welcome everybody to uh, the education stage in Hall 4.2 of the Frankfurt Book Fair 2018. Uh, I'm Carl Robinson, Head of Consulting at ICSIS, a copyright clearance centre or CCC owned subsidiary based in London. Only a year ago the Directory of Open Access Books marked the 10,000 titles milestone. Today, this important service of the Open Foundation, based at the National Library in The Hague, lists almost 13,000 academic peer-reviewed books and chapters from 282 publishers, including De Gruyter, Press Sorbonne Nouvelle, University of North Texas Press, and Heidelberg University Publishing, among many others. Open access is transforming scholarly journal publishing, yet the looming size of the journal ecosystem has thrown into deep shadow an equally remarkable transformation in scholarly books. In recent years, ebook acquisition rates and usage have soared. Ebooks offer multiple advantages, from acquisition models to accessibility and researcher engagement metrics. In parallel with research coming out of the UK, an ongoing study by the US-based Book Industry Study Group, or BISG, is identifying the challenges in understanding the usage of OA eBooks. This research will provide much needed documentation on eBook impact levels, especially for funders of open access publishing programs. Our own panel discussion will discuss the viability, models, and the unique needs of OA books compared to OA journals. And joining me nearest me here is Brian O'Leary, Executive Director of the New York City-based BISG, Book Industry Study Group, and one of the principal um, investigators on the project to understand OAE e-book usage. And furthest from me over there, David Warlock, a long-time independent publishing analyst and co-chair of Outsell's leadership programs, whose most recent blog post is in the area on the hot topic of Plan S. Do we have a Plan B, he asks. <laughs> Something I'm sure we're all, industry, all very interested in. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. So David, if I can turn to you first, uh, where are we with open access at the moment? Uh, in book terms, um, uh, I think we're struggling. I think we've made a, a really interesting start. A lot of publishers have, uh, have played, uh, but several things seem to me to be um, missing from the picture. Um, what's happened in, in uh, open access journal publishing, article publishing, is a clear business model around APCs there is not that clarity in the book world. Um, uh, 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 charges to authors vary hugely. There, are, there is a danger of escalating charges to authors or putting the costs of doing this beyond many uh, authors' uh, uh, ability to pay. Equally, um, uh, there is a, a, a sort of uh, a duality, it seems to me. Uh, on the one hand, we are releasing these books, but we are not effectively releasing them into a world where machines can read them as easily as people. And we have to reflect that within five years of this date, the readers of books will be in the majority machines, and in the minority people, especially in scholarly areas, especially in areas of high technical content, uh, the books will begin to speak to the books uh, and they have to be marked up, they have to be, uh, they have to have the right metadata, they have to have the right uh, attention to detail in the process of making them available for machines to read. Now, uh, I think we are lagging behind in this, in this sphere. So I see the road towards open access in books as being uh, uh, a, a less even, more broken road than open access in journal articles. And I should be interested to know if, if Brian agrees with this. Well, I, I do. I think your assessment's really good, and we hadn't kicked around the machine-to-machine -machine piece, but I would, I would amplify that. Um, I think when you say there's no business, no clear business model, for us that, that came down to there's no clear way to measure what's actually happening. 
mm. uh, and the project that you mentioned at the outset, uh, which is uh, funded by the Mellon Foundation and involves the University of Michigan, mm. University of North Texas, which you also mentioned, and Knowledge Unlatched. We're trying to find the superset of, of uh, measurement points that would effectively say, how do you know whether an open access work is being prescribed, is, there's uptake, what's the readership, et cetera. And I think the machine-to-machine -machine piece might be really interesting within that as well. Can I then go on one stage and sure. say, um, I do believe that uh, this will be a fertile area for fresh business models. And I've been very much involved in a project in Berlin called Knowledge Unlatched, which has been experimenting now successfully for three years with a different sort of business model for, as they would say, unlatching books. That is to crowdfund by way of library budgets. Yep. So if you can get a number of libraries, they deal with up to 700 libraries uh, around the world, to subscribe effectively, then you can open the book to the world. So all of the initiation costs are covered, all of the, uh, 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 of the outlay in originating and marking up and preparing the text are then covered, and you can then unlatch it so that everybody in those who uses those libraries but actually then everybody who uses any library or anybody who uses uh, uh, any system can then read that book. And I think the advantage there too is it solves a problem that libraries, it doesn't solve the entire problem, but it, it, it addresses a problem that libraries face in that there's predictability in, in how much money that you're going to spend and you have unlimited access in perpetuity, uh, which are problems for a lot of the paid models right now for libraries. There's either a, a very high price, an unpredictable price, or a restriction on how many uses uh, you have for that content. I find, too, that libraries are concerned with um, open access books that they fear become the vanity projects of authors or sometimes foundations or sometimes uh, special interests. Sure. So uh, um, commercial publication was one of the defenses against that. Remove that defense, make the book open, and then uh, the network becomes full of uh, material which either was not worthy of publication or is put there plainly for a propagandist purpose. And, we, and I agree with you about Knowledge Unlatched. As I said, in the project that we're working on right now, they're one of the, they're the primary uh, data gatherer on right. the project. Um, and there'll be part the white paper that's currently being drafted. There'll be, a, there's going to be a discussion in, um, December in New York, a convening of about two dozen uh, stakeholders, uh, led by Knowledge Unlatched and um, and then moderated as well. But our goal is to take the draft paper, use it as a discussion point, and then come out of the, this summit or convening with uh, that both that superset and maybe some agreements about how to move forward on the business models. Mm. So. Mm. so you mentioned the superset there. So that you, that's about trying to get better understanding of the data and the analytics there, and that will give us what? Well, with, with understanding, if you actually know how, how a book is being used, how widely it's being used, if you can measure um, the, the, the platforms and or uh, institutions that are prescribing it, uh, I think that gives you a starting point for saying, all right, this has a value, uh, and we should fund it, and we can fund it in this way. So, and that's our, that's our game plan overall. So, uh, with, it, with this kind of context as, that you're both talking about, what, what is there out there that's going to give us hope for the future when it comes to OA eBooks? Uh, you, want, uh, <laughs> you go first. <laughs> um, well, I have, hu I have huge hope for the future. I, uh, I really do believe that, um, uh, that we are um, uh, going to create a wider shared knowledge base in society of genuine utility. But this will only take place if we are able to fully explore uh, the possibilities of open access 
especially in books. Um, and by fully explore, I mean uh, that we have to sharpen all the time our ability to, uh, to intelligently search things. We need to search, for example, by concepts. You'll find around this fair lots of AI players, artificial intelligence players, who are beginning on this process of moving towards concept-based searching. Only when you or I or the machine next to us can search a whole range of books together and find where certain concepts are mentioned and where they um, uh, are explained or explored, only then are we going to get real utility into, uh, into this business. And not, let's not forget the illustration. I think we have, um, in, the, in the world of technology, been hugely neglectful of the importance of being able to search images, video, animations, and to link them to the text. Sure. And I think we're now beginning to catch up on this. And those who open access books have to prepare them so that they can be effectively searched in this way. And I, I think, building on this, that one of the things I think that's really promising is there is greater attention because of topics like accessibility. There's greater attention paid to workflows. And so, therefore, there's greater attention being paid to creating the input uh, that you need to tag non-textual assets in a, in, a go, in a good way. Yes. The, I think the thing that I would say for, for me that's really promising, in addition to unglue it and similar smaller efforts that are akin to knowledge unlatch, uh, is the American Assembly's Open Syllabus Project, I was gonna ask uh, which is uh, um, you know American Assembly's based up at Columbia University in New York City, and for the last four or five years, they've been collecting syllabi and essentially cataloging what's being prescribed. And they're about to they're, they're now developing tools to report out. It's going to give us a greater understanding of both paid and non-paid uh, open access texts that are being actually used in courseware throughout the world and uh, you know it I think it's going to give us a different sense of what best sellers and what utility looks like that's excellent so we've we've had quite a good uh, you know quick overview of where we are with OA so thanks to, to you both on that some ideas some some different things that are out there that can give us some hope and so on but I, I guess the question Brian if I turn yeah. back to you what do you see as the next big thing or the next issue that OA books needs to tackle. Well, it, it, this might reflect that I work for an organization that fundamentally looks at supply chain issues, but I, I do see open access as a supply chain issue. I think that there's been efforts to push on one area, push on another area, and say, how is it going to get funded, or how can we not have it funded? And uh, I think if we look at it across the entire supply chain, I, then we're better off. That's why we liked and we're happy to participate in the Mellon project, because the, the study is going to open up a variety of different opportunities for us to say where could we optimize not for publishers or for authors or for libraries but for the entire supply chain so and, and David same question to you really what, what do you um, what do you think's next what's the next big thing well I think Brian uh, dropped the word which I uh, um, a most keen on at the moment when he said the, the word workflow. Um, yeah. uh, one of the things which is going to change all of our lives in the next five years um, lingers under, and how American is this, lingers under the acronym um, uh, uh, um, uh, RBA, uh, Robotic Process Automation, RPA. Now, What's that all about? It's about taking things which we do routinely and making them work as something which a computer can do, something which can be done in a network. Many of the things which we do routinely involve looking up books. I've just been working on a project to create legal contracts. Sometimes you have to, to, to look at a dozen law books to find the right precedents or the right 
arguments which have to go into, uh, into a, a particular contractual situation. Now, doing that becomes uh, an extremely uh, um, automate, automatable uh, activity. RPA, uh, um, therefore, needs to be a reader of lots and lots of different books. If those books are open, that, of course, is a much easier environment to work in. But how do you license uh, uh, a machine which may look into a law book today, but may not look into the same law book again for six months? It, it's extremely difficult. Um, uh, and so, so all sorts of ideas are now welling up around um, open access to knowledge materials and the way we build our future in uh, networked communication. So I think this is hugely exciting. So yeah. both of those things, are the supply chain and workflow and so on, um, what, what would you say are the key challenges for publishers of OA books in order to kind of take advantage of that future that, that you're both painting? Well, I think the biggest challenge on, on workflow is, is uh, you typically want to design something with the end in mind. So you want to say, what are all the uses? You know, how many different channels are we going to support? How can we do it? So if you want to create print books and e-books and audio books all from one source, and we don't know what the end looks like yet. And so the, the challenge is, and I hope, I hope the project that I'm working on now begins to get at that. It at least shapes what, what the end looks like. But it's, uh, you don't want to overinvest in workflow and create products that don't have a demand. Mm. On the other hand, if, you, if, RBC, if RPC is really the, the end game, you're going to have to have much more robust data gathering and content structuring at the beginning of the process. Otherwise, there's nothing to find. Absolutely. But the answer to me, to your question, uh, Carl, is, is imagination. Here we have, in all these halls, hundreds and hundreds of, of publishers, people who uh, are intimate with, what, with usage and the way people want usage to be. But I am frustrated at times by the fact that um, we don't seem to be able to uh, make the digital world as inventive as it possibly could be. Yeah. And I think uh, the, um, the electronic book is an example of this. I keep reading figures and statistics from, from people who say, oh, well, the demand for electronic books is going down, etc., etc. I'm not at all surprised. Not at all surprised. If you turn the electronic book into a simple reprint of something which once existed in print, why should people be more um, entranced by that than they were by the original print product? You've simply changed the transmission system. It is time for electronic publishing and the electronic book to stand up uh, as a genuinely newly minted product in its own right uh, with uh, uh, and, and the way in which in, in, in the network you can integrate video and text and, uh, uh, and visuals is far enhanced from the experience you can give on the page of a book. Why don't we use it for what it can do? I, I quite agree, and, and we'll, we'll turn to the audience in a moment or two for, for any questions, so if you're busy thinking of them. But d it, just from my own experience in thinking about format agnosticism and you know, that whole idea of being able to create content that you don't know what the end delivery channel is, is becoming more and more important across the publishing industry. And what you're talking about, David, is bringing those things together as well yeah. and taking advantage of that and leveraging it. So. And I'm also talking about the ability of audiences to make their own products from, from the body con. of information which is in the open network. That's great. Uh, I, mean, I mean, this really does give us hope for the future then, I think. Yeah. And uh, uh, So I just throw it open to the audience. Are there any questions for uh, Brian or David or both of them? There's, there's one over there. Could we perhaps get a microphone over there? 
while we're waiting, I just wanted to add that uh, I think that there's a the supply chain component of this is critically important as well because, in effect, if you're trying to think through how you're going to create content that works across multiple platforms like that, um, most ebooks, in the, especially in the trade space, but also in the in the academic and scholarly space, are provide are created by third parties, and the metadata often is scraped or or transformed. Uh, I think we have to think about how we create digital content and not make it a third party. Go ahead. Can, can we use your microphone, David? Just to, the, the lady at the back there. So, thanks. Excuse me? And, and so I think that the current supply chain essentially encourages suboptimal creation of digital content. Right. Um, my question is about GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Uh, what do you think about their invisible position in this book fair, and what do you think about their position in open source uh, publishing? Do you want to wait? Or so, <laughs> I'll, I'll just get your microphone back. <laughs> I, I have opinions, but I, I'm going to defer I'm sure to David. David will have a good answer for you, so with bated breath, he now has a I, I'm not sure I have a good answer, <laughs> but I would simply make the remark that they are as you, as you say, invisible. Um, you never see them here. And that's because they don't think this is very important. I have to say that. They don't think this is very important. They think that they exist on a layer above the layer of content and that all content will always be all available to everybody in the networks. Now, um, that is not entirely true, but so far they have been able to prevail because um, uh, they have been able to create economic units which are stronger than, uh, uh, than the publishing commercial units. Um, in the future, however, I'm not sure that's going to be quite the same. Um, you may have seen that um, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the, um, of the uh, um, World Wide Web, recently uh, created a web presence called Silo. You can go and look at it at, at uh, silo.com. And... Uh, on Silo, he, uh, he oh, sorry, Solid.com, on Solid, he tells you about decentralizing the web. Now, if the web were to be greatly decentralized, you were in control of your own intellectual property and your own privacy, um, uh, then the, the big nodes would be much less powerful. And I think that we mustn't fall into the trap in thinking they will always be there and they will always be dominant. This situation can change. Thank you. Agreed. Brian, I, 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 do think, I do think it's a fluid situation and we, sh we can't define it just on one timestamp. But I am really concerned that they're not here and I have a, maybe a slightly different take on why. I don't think publishers take the platform seriously. I, I don't think that they're actively involved in how EPUBs are created, how, how standards, what standards are followed, the impact of DRM on those platforms, and how it creates lock-in for many customer sets. I mean, this is somewhat separate from open access. Mm. But I, I, I'm very concerned because I think that there's a, almost like somebody else, it, it's as if you were a retailer and you're, you can be at arm's length and we'll ship you a book and you'll either sell it or you won't and it might come back. And that's not the right attitude for digital content and I think that we're both missing an opportunity as a result. Um, thank you both. Timothy Wright from Edinburgh University Press. Can I just, bringing it back to open access monographs and by access, open access monographs we're talking monographs in the humanities and social sciences principally, because obviously STEM is covered by the, by the journals in OA largely. Um, and as far as the UK is concerned, the, there are two central points which are still being discussed and, and, and for which no decision really has been made. First of all, the creators of these projects seem to have been left out of the equation. There, are, there is very little engagement between the funding bodies um, and the authors 
in the humanities and social sciences, the vast majority of whom are not funded at all by any um, uh, anybody like Welcome Foundation. So the big question, therefore, is where is the funding going to come from for those academics? And if there is no uh, hunger on those academics and there's no engagement by the funding bodies with universities, um, which there isn't at the moment, how is OA going to go forward as far as monographs are concerned? So, Brian, maybe we could turn to you first sure, while we get David's microphone back. Yeah, so. I, I agree. I mean, I think if, if there's not an institutional funding model for the essentially the creation of the original work, then you don't have, there's no compensation method afterwards. And I don't think there's any, there, there are mild discussions about royalties or some sort of limited payment. Um, but we kind of, I mean, our focus has largely been on the U.S. When we do the convening, we're going to have representatives from both uh, Europe and, and the U.S. participating. And part of that was because there are differences in the, in the two communities. But the other thing that we haven't done, and I, I think may, your question points at, we don't have anyone currently coming to the convening that represents authorship. So it's, it's, it's something to think, I, I need to think about a little bit more. So know. just just quickly, one, just, just maybe right. in one minute, David. Uh, okay. Um, I, I think I would say most uh, authors that I know of anyway, of scholarly monographs and um, uh, in, in uh, uh, humanities and social sciences are not in it for the money. And indeed, much monograph publishing has fallen by the wayside in recent years because it's not economically viable. Open access through a library crowdfunding system does in fact cover that. It makes sure that the monograph is, is published and available, but it also um, does not load a load of cost on an author who needs or wants to be published for tenure purposes or for getting uh, more uh, 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 work or projects to do. Um, it, so no financial burden falls there, and at the same time, his work, his, her work, is available and garners reputation and, uh, uh, and builds feedback. So I think that sort of, of uh, subscription uh, crowdfunding model is particularly appropriate in the circumstances you describe. So thank you, David. Thank you, Brian. It's been a very interesting discussion. I'm afraid we're going to have to draw a line under it there because we've we come to time. So thank you all for all attending. And I'm sure David and Brian will be standing around a little bit. So if you want to grab them and collar them afterwards. Not, not under thank the you light, very much. So. I'm Cole Robinson.